I'm Mark Unger, producer of Roundtable. Because we find this presentation so special, we really would like for you to see this. Please watch. fun to be here. I think this is the fifth time, sixth time, something like that, that um, we've done a, 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 a book thing here at the Strand. We're rolling. Thank you. Uh, so today I've seen uh, you from a completely different point of view. I'm as sorry actually, about that. <laughs> oh, it was actually quite a thrill. And uh, today i actually seen uh, you as a person popularizing other people's works and other people's art. Yes. And uh, it actually was quite a revelation for me. And one of the things you mentioned was that uh, this book, The Vision Share, influenced uh, careers of some of the photographers who was in the book in a positive way, actually mm -hmm. gave the second uh, life and second breath to their career. And uh, that actually made me to wonder about, about one question. How working on this project, interfacing with all those true masters of photography in yes. their own ways influenced the way you actually uh, was continuing to work as a photographer, how it influenced your photographic experience and your photographic path. Well, what it, what it really did was it showed me the, the, the kind of thing that you can do if you have a single-minded project and you stick to it and, and try to develop it as best you can because that is what somebody like Jack Delano, if he wanted to go down and photograph people in the sugarcane fields, he would do it from start to finish and cover every aspect of it as he possibly could and to be as thorough as he could. And if I have a project that I want to do like that, I try to emulate that kind of dedication. On the, on the vision shared situation, the um, Resettlement Administration started a photographic project to document the plight of the rural poor um, with the aim in mind of convincing Congress, showing pictures of people in, in dire straits and so forth, to pass legislation that would help these people. And um, the Resettlement Administration eventually morphed into the Farm Security Administration. And these people created a archive of, I don't know, a quarter of a million photographs from the years 1935 until basically un until the war started uh, when whoever was left in the Farm Security Administration roles were transferred over to the Office of War Information. Um, but created an incredible archive of, of photographs that um, to this day are major, major. It, it, it was, it's, it's the, probably the finest photographic archive of that period that exists anywhere in the world. Um, and it was also the finest group of photographers anybody ever uh, put together in the world. But, um, so I, I looked at these two books and I says, darn, I mean, they're all because of the New Deal and Roosevelt. They're primarily because of the 1930s. And um, it would probably make sense to talk about them together because much of the, and, and, and they're, they're pertinent today because many of the difficulties that we're looking at um, are people who are still mad at, at Franklin Roosevelt and the New Deal who want to privatize Social Security or do something like that. There's actually a picture of it. In that it's about this big. There's 36 rolls of film that are just tightly wound. They're different. I have no idea on if you can think back, and many of you can't because you're not old enough, but uh, when I came to New York City in, the, in 1967, one of the first things I did was join the Museum of Modern Art. It cost $30. And for the $30, you got to go to all the free movies. Uh, and when you were on a rather fixed budget like I was, free movies were nice. And um, they also gave you two books a year for free. And one of the books was uh, a book of photographs 
by a guy, about a guy named Walker Evans. Um, it was a good book, and I liked it. Another thing that the Museum of Modern Art had uh, in those years, and I don't know how long it lasted, but it lasted long enough for me to acquire a couple of pictures. They had an art lending service, um, and you could go up to the art lending room, which was a tiny little space, again, about the size of the chairs here, and for $30, I was able to rent a Walker Evans photograph to put on my wall uh, and keep it for three months. And if you liked it and wanted to keep it, you could apply the $30 to um, the purchase price, which was $100. And so I rented one for $30. I decided I liked it, and I kept it. It's still on the other side of that wall, on the wall. And um, about the same time, maybe a year or so later, uh, I went to visit a gallery, which was called the Witkin Gallery, which most of you have never heard of. But the Witkin Gallery was the first real photograph gallery in New York City. Lee Witkin started it in about 1969-70, and um, he was the first. And we got to be friends, and he um, had a wonderful selection of photographs and books and things like that, and had shows. And he had a browser bin about this deep. And I was going through it, and damn, look, there is a Walker Evans photograph. That's the picture I got. And how much is it? I turned it over, and it was um, $15. And so I said, um, uh, Mr. Whitkin, this, I, I bought one of these at the museum, and it was $100, and yours is $15. What, why, why is this? And he says, oh, well, in the first place, Walker Evans didn't sign this picture. I bought this one at the Library of Congress for $2.50. I gave it to a guy named George Tice, and George Tice washed it and cleaned it and put it on this, mounted it on a little card, and um, I've got to make some kind of a profit. I had to give George 250 to clean it up, so I'm selling it for 15. I can make ten dollars and pay my rent. And <laughs> I said, "Hey, I think I'll buy this one," and and I did. And I said, "Where did you say you got this?" And he said, "I got this at the Library of Congress." And um, what I did, I got a not the same one that I had, but he had half a dozen different Evans pictures. And I says, I squirreled it away in the back of my head. I said, that's something I should look into. About the same time, about 1973, I found a book that was called In This Proud Land. And it was a book of these photographs from the Farm Security Administration. And it was a pretty good book, um, but it didn't tell anything much about the photographers. It just had pictures and an essay, and these were the favorite photographs of a man named Roy Stryker, who was in charge of the Farm Security Administration photographers. And I thought to myself, well, this is sort of, this is terrific seeing all these pictures, but I wonder about the photographers, what, who, who they were and so forth. I knew of Walker Evans because I had the book. In any event, um, a month or two or through whatever it was later, I had to go to Washington for something. In those years, I was still a full-time employee of the Central Intelligence Agency, and I had to go down to Washington for things ever so often. But I played hooky one afternoon and went over to the Library of Congress and went to the Prints and Photographs Division, where it was a pretty good-sized room. It was much bigger than the <laughs> little area with the chairs, and I... Um, ask about these things, they say, oh yeah, they're over there. And here were banks of, of um, file cabinets with four drawers that you could pull out. And you could just go in and you could look. And they had all of these FSA photographs on cardboard, stuck to cardboard. I don't know whether they were dry mounted or glued or whatever, but they were there. And you could just flip through them. And if you saw something you liked, you could write a number down and you could hand the number in to the people at the desk, 
And for $2.50, you could get a Walker Evans photograph from the original 8x10 negative on good paper. If you wanted to pay $3.50, an extra dollar, you could get it on really good paper. Uh, and it was, uh, and, and I was, you know, I, I thought this was really kind of exciting. So I squirreled this away in the back of my head. In 73, um, the, my, my first book, uh, about a musician named Betty Condon came out, and the Eddie uh, had died just before it came out, but the editor of the book was very keen on doing something else. And uh, it, that was at a time when, I guess, people really ask you to, 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 to do books, and um, you didn't have to chase them. And Les said he, you know, think up a good project. So a week or so later, I went to him and I said, Les, here's a good idea. I said, and I had a copy of this book called uh, uh, In This Proud Land. And I said, look, here are a bunch of really good photographs. They are all in the public domain, which means you can make a book out of them and you don't have to pay anything. Um, this book has many of the good pictures, but it doesn't tell anything about the people who took them. Why don't we do a book that would take the, the best of the photographs from this project and then, but have the photographers pick them out and deal with the photographers. Most of them are all still alive. Uh, so Les said, well, that's a good idea. There you go. Couldn't be better. Yeah. Yeah. And I kind of inherited this archive and actually two archives of the people I bought my house from, uh -huh. Cal and Florence Reif. Al Reif was a high fashion advertising photographer. And he's a jazz guy. No, but they had a daughter who photographed all the great jazz artists. I went out to try and sort out finding all the people. And nine of the photographers were still alive. And I found Carl Maidans in Singapore and Theo Young in um, Vienna, and Marion Post Walcott was in um, Santa Barbara, and John Collier was in San Francisco, and John Vashon actually just lived up the street. Uh, he was here in New York City. Arthur Rothstein was here in New York City. Jack Delano, I found him in Rio Pietras in Puerto Rico. Um, Jack had been sent to Puerto Rico to photograph down there, <laughs> um, and he had gone down in like October of 42 or something like that. And um, they started dropping bombs on Hawaii a couple of months later. And Jack was trapped in Puerto Rico for the rest of the war and basically never came back uh, and, and stayed down there. Russell Lee was in Austin, Texas. And um, Dorothea Lang was dead, but I found her husband, Paul Taylor, in Berkeley. And um, Ben Sean was dead, but Bernarda Sean was in Roosevelt, New Jersey, and eager to, eager to be involved. <clears throat> and the only person I couldn't find was Walker Evans. And I was chatting with um, John Vashon one day, and I was bemoaning the fact that I couldn't find Evans. And he says, well, you're just stupid. And I says, what, what do you mean? He says, well, he's in the phone book. And I said, he doesn't live in New York. He says, yeah, I know he doesn't live in New York, but he's in the phone book. And so I look in the phone. Sure enough, Walker Evans, Old Lyme, Connecticut. And I called him. And um, no, I don't want to talk about that. And I probably called him five or six times. He was the only person who wasn't eager and enthusiastic about doing this. And <clears throat> uh, finally, he said, OK, OK, come on up here. Uh, you're just going to bother me to death if I don't talk to you. And I said, okay. And so I drove up to Old Lyme, Connecticut. Um, he had given me specific instructions about look for the house at the crossroads that has no windows in the front. Okay, that's a different kind of looking house. So went up there to, and, and found that house. And I had borrowed a car from a friend because mine was messed up. This guy's car was also messed up, but not as bad as mine. But the right headlight was held in by um, band-aids and when I drove into Evans's front yard literally into his front yard it was a dirt thing that drove up to the house 
Um, he, I got out of the car, he saw I had a camera with me, an SX-70, and he pointed at the headlight and he said, take a picture of that. <laughs> and I took up my camera and I said, yes, sir. I took two, um, I, one for me and one for him. If it's good enough for him, it's good enough for me. And uh, we went inside and I looked around and um, he, Walker Evans didn't have a single photograph on the wall. He had trade signs, Coca-Cola or some automotive shop or something like that. He also had a square table about this square in the middle of the living room. And <laughs> there were four chairs around it. And in three of the chairs were fully dressed mannequins. And I'm thinking to myself, where am I? <laughs> and at one point he says, okay, let's go out on the back porch and talk. And I said, that's a good idea. <laughs> and we went outside. But as we were going out the back door to the porch, I looked down and by the door was a pile about this high of records. And the one on the top was, I don't know if it was Fats Waller or Louis Armstrong, but it was a jazz record. And I thought to myself, I'm home free. And the first interview with Walker Evans was him interviewing me. He was just thrilled to talk to somebody who actually knew Jimmy Rushing. I'll bet most of the folks here don't know who Jimmy Rushing, he was a great blues singer with Count Basie's band. And Evans was saying, oh, God, he is just so wonderful. He says, I was once on a ship with him, but I was too shy to say anything. Okay. Anyway, uh, met all of the um, FSA guys, worked with them all, and what set this book apart from all the others that, well, the one that had been made before, and then the 150 that have come afterwards, is that this is the only one where the photographers had the input to pick out their favorite pictures. I wanted both books, but my backpack is far too heavy for that one, so <laughs> this is This is a killer. I know. <laughs> I mean, I don't already, that been, far so they come in boxes of five, it. and you can barely lift them. What it led to, it led to um, the rediscovery of some of these photographers like Russell Lee and Jack Delano and Marion Post all had shows at major galleries now. They, it, it started their, their careers all over, jump started them. They, may, they had always had careers, but they now had gallery careers and, and, and sold pictures. Uh, the book sold out, they made 10,000 of them. Um, and that was that, they never did a second printing because it was the last book that St. Martin's did with hot type. And when it was over, after they made the 10,000 run, they pied the type, and <laughs> they had nothing else to reprint it with, unless they wanted to make a, you know, a photographic copy of it. Um, and time passed. And 40 years later, through a series of, of wonderful events, largely due to a series of books um, uh, that I've done in conjunction with um, my friend Ron Kurtz and Gerhard Steidel. Steidel has issued 10 books uh, about Bernie Sabbat that, that we've done. And um, the, one of the things, uh, we, we talked about a lot of different projects when we were working on the Abbott book. And Gerhardt was very interested in reissuing A Vision Shared. Um, and as I said, it was supposed to come out in 2016, but there were issues with regard to bindings and all sorts of book things that I don't really fully understand. But um, Gerhardt made, has made a truly spectacular book. It's exactly like this one the old one, uh, in terms of the photographs that are in it. Um, but it's about 80 pages longer because Gerhardt believes that a photograph should be on a page and it, it can say, you know, like You say you, know, you took a Leica to, with him on the war. Yes. Did he get you your first camera? No, my first camera came from a, a um, raffle in uh, Bloomington, Indiana. I remember uh, I, was, I was a cabin boy in the first, in the premiere of Billy Budd, Benjamin Britten's Billy Budd. And there were four of us, and we just loved it because we could smear all this 
junk all over us and we were carrying gunpowder and stuff like that. And my mother came to fetch me and she says, oh, by the way, <coughs> you won a, uh, a prize, a camera, at the raffle at the local grocery store. I says, oh, let's that. You, say, you can't go in there looking like that. So I had to wait till the next day, but I got a little brownie hawkeye. And that was the, the first camera. When my father came back from World War II, he was very sick. Um, and he was in military hospitals for over a year. And one of the things that he did while he was there was teach himself leather work. He had to do something. He was, and um, so he made a scrapbook full of pictures of all the wartime pictures. He, he carried a Leica with him in, um, in World War II. Um, so I had always known about that. I hadn't known about some of the other scrapbooks. The primary one was one that I found that had been my mother's scrapbook in the 30s, beginning in 32 and up to 1940. I had actually um, uh, thought about doing something with it in about 1980 uh, and wrote a little essay and gave it to uh, Jackie Onassis because at that time there was a a book that was very popular called The Diary of an Edwardian Lady, and I was silly enough to think that it might be fun to have a thing that was called The Diary of an East Texas Lady or something. And, um, and I, I knew her a little bit because she was the editor of my first, the first editor on my first Bernice Abbott book. And she was a nice, smart uh, uh, lady. Um, she looked at it, didn't quite know what to do with it, and I didn't either, and I dropped it and put it away for a, a long time. And then, through a, a series of, of peculiar events, I got involved with the Texas Christian University Press. Um, they wanted to do uh, a project. I gave them a list of, of some things, and this is what they picked. Um, uh, it was not the one that I thought would, <laughs> that anybody would, but uh, they thought it would resonate. Uh, and, there, and there was a, uh, a, a peculiar angle to it in that in 1945, when my father came back from the war, we lived in Fort Worth, Texas, uh, which is where TCU is. And the, when he came back, uh, he was not quite as tall as I am. He was about 5'11", but he weighed 110 pounds, or maybe 112 on a good day, and was very sick, had to go to the hospital, and they couldn't cure him. And so he wound up being 37 years old with no job, out of the Army, uh, and not very healthy. Um, now, he did get the medical disability forever and ever, but um, he had to find a way to earn a living. And the living came back by, uh, at the age of 37, he enrolled as a freshman at TCU. Um, so the university that published this book, um, they're in the story. They're, they're, they're part of it, which made it really, rather sweet. Um, and so what I did was I um, found all of these extra pictures that somehow my mother and father had saved. And uh, I mean, I just opened it here at, at random. At, and in, it's the section called the Philippines. Um, my father's job was he was the provost marshal of the 14th Corps, which meant he was the head MP. He was a major, had a company of, I don't know, 300 guys or something. And he had saved the map that they used for the invasion of the Philippines. Oh, that is his company, the one they went, where, where, where they went in. And I looked at this and I just couldn't believe it because the map that he saved that was the map he used to go down the highway to wherever he had to go was published by Mobile Gas before the war. That's what they had. <laughs> and um, uh, if you can imagine going into you know, quite a, quite a fierce battle um, with nothing but a map from a filling station uh, in, in, in any event. But we, um, I accumulated all the stuff that I could beginning in the, the late teens and sequenced it and 
wound up with about 540 illustrations and a story, which tracks um, two um, fairly, uh, you know, just ordinary people. I mean, they, they didn't have great backgrounds or anything like that. Um, my father's dad was a carpenter in Dallas. Uh, my mom's dad was a, 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 ran a drugstore in Tyler, Texas. Uh, and so it wasn't as though it was starting from a, 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 a fancy place. But what was nice about it was that it all kind of wound up just right. And um, that's what this story is, and it's, it's kind, of, kind of positive. Um, I mean, these guys believed in, these guys and girls, believed in what they were doing, and that's why they took good pictures. If you believe in the kind of stuff that you're working on, and I don't care whether it's taking pictures of graffiti on the walls or people dancing in the streets or whatever it is, if you believe in what you're working on, then you'll take better pictures. And that's what I saw in these 11 people that I worked with, that they really believed in what they were doing. So, and it makes a difference. So basically, a conviction to the cause it's exactly. is a key to of course photography. It is. Well, it is I actually for would agree time. with it. Yeah. It actually makes perfect sense. I yeah. didn't think in this direction what it truly does. It, it, if you believe in what you're doing, you, you do better work. So, or you try to do better work. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Hopefully not. <laughs> yeah. All we can do is uh, try. Well, thank you very much. Good. Glad and, you were uh, here. Congratulations. I've thank you. This feels. Yeah. Isn't that something? I just feels. You know, that's a hell of a job he did too. Very leather work. He's learned how to make them up. Make me a cowboy holster thing. I would like to be a cowboy. found that worth watching as much as I did. I'm Mark Unger for Roundtable. Thanks for watching.